thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here. For well over a decade now, I've been focused on the potential implications of artificial intelligence and robotics. And uh, I've now written actually four books on that subject. And I have pretty consistently held to the view that we are on the leading edge of what I think is going to be a massive disruption. Ultimately, I think that that will be a transformation on the scale of a new industrial revolution. Uh, and I think we're seeing some pretty clear evidence, really, just within the last year, that this is really beginning to, to unfold. Uh, and I do think, clearly, there are going to be two sides to this disruption. On the one hand, it's going to bring enormous benefits to all of humanity. It's going to be transformative in areas like science and medicine and technology. It's going to drive innovation and creativity really across the board. And we're going to see accelerated technological progress in many, many different areas. And that's going to bring terrific benefits really to all of us. But there is another side to this. It's going to be enormously disruptive to society, to the economy, and I think especially uh, to the job market. So given that I believe very strongly that this is, you know, the AI is a uniquely consequential technology, I think that more than any other innovation, artificial intelligence is going to shape the future. I want to begin by talking about what really sets uh, AI apart, what makes it different from other innovations. And you know, one of the things that's key is that for the first time, we're talking about machines that in a limited sense are beginning to think. We're talking about machines and algorithms that have true cognitive capability. Clearly, algorithms, machines are beginning to make decisions, they're solving problems, and really, most importantly, they're learning. And we're seeing, of course, just within the last year especially, that they're also beginning to generate content, generate new kinds of information. Um, but at the core of this, the really the central idea here is, is really all about machine learning, this idea that we now have smart algorithms that are churning through uh, massive amounts of information, and based on that, they're learning and they're gaining insights, they're making predictions. Um, they're figuring out how to do things, and increasingly, they're actually generating new content. And this is um, becoming an enormously disruptive and important technology. Artificial intelligence is becoming ubiquitous. It's turning into what I think of as a true general-purpose technology. Um, it's becoming almost like a utility, almost in many ways as powerful and as ubiquitous as electricity. Uh, now, you think about what your life would be like even for one day without electricity. We, we, we rely on electricity for everything. It, it you know, invades every aspect of our life, our culture. Um, nearly everything we do throughout the day is in some one way or another dependent on electricity, which is why it's such a disaster if, if we lose electric power. Um, and I think that clearly artificial intelligence is evolving to become similar. We are similarly going to be dependent on it, it's similarly going to scale across every aspect of society and culture. Um, one of the, the things that's really driving this is the integration of artificial intelligence into cloud computing, right? Um, already, nearly every organization of any size, every business, other types of organization, they already use you know, cloud computing resources from companies like Amazon and Google and Microsoft. Um, and artificial intelligence is being integrated directly into that. Um, and companies like Google and Microsoft are in intense competition with each other to bring the latest advances in AI and integrate it into their, their services, which are then becoming available you know, to everyone, literally. So, so you can kind of think of as cloud computing as being the main transmission lines for this new utility, um, a little bit like electricity. So I, I do think that... Um, you know, we're going to see some amazing things as this, this progression continues. Okay. Uh, uh, so the central technology that really underlies all of this and is making this uh, really possible is what's called deep learning or, or deep neural networks. And essentially what this is, uh, you know, neural networks are essentially a very rudimentary kind of simulation of the way neurons work within, within our brains um, at a very kind of um, basic level. But even though this was you know, a known approach to computing, for decades, it really didn't have much in the way of practical applications. 
Um, and that is something that changed roughly 10 years ago. Actually, in the year 2012 is really the year you could point to that was kind of the inflection point where this technology really took off. And what happens is that a few things came together. So around the year 2012, you know, the, 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 possibility, the capability of computers really reached a point where this became a practical technology. And the other thing that happened, of course, is that we now have you know, really just incomprehensible amounts of data compared to what we had, you know, say in the 1990s or something. The amount of data that's just available in the world is just, just staggering. And as a result of that, there were some important breakthroughs, first in image recognition, in innovations that a short time ago we would have considered science fiction. Things like, for example, instant language translation. Um, Things like, you know, self-driving cars, which are getting close to, to being a reality. Uh, you know, conversational computing, like uh, Amazon's Alexa or Apple's Siri. And yet, the key thing I, I would point out is that we are clearly in the infancy here. You know, this is just getting started. We have a long way to go, and the ultimate objective, of course, is to build a machine, a system, that approaches or matches or, or someday even exceeds uh, the human brain and capability, you know, to, to, to really to build true human-level artificial intelligence. Um, I believe that AI is going to bring an enormous boost to innovation, to scientific research, um, to the advance of, of technology in a number of fields. And the reason is that it's going to amplify our creativity. Um, it's going to take our own ingenuity and, and essentially you know, accelerate that. Um, so this example involves uh, DeepMind, which is the division of Google um, that's based in London. This is the company that built the AlphaGo system that you probably heard of that was able to defeat the best uh, Go player in the world back in 2016. You know, the, the, the benefits, the fruits of progress are really being captured by the people at the top of the income distribution. In other words, by business owners, executives, investors, uh, very, very highly paid, skilled employees. These kinds of people are doing very well. They're continuing to getting all the benefits from progress. But average, typical workers, you know, especially hourly factory workers and, 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 and people in the service sector, are really not participating in progress at all. They're really kind of being left behind. And I think that if you look at this graph, there are a number of things going on here, but certainly one of the most important things that I think explains what's happening here is that the nature of technology is changing. If you look back at that golden age after World War II up until the 1970s, um, machines were clearly tools. They were something that workers used that made those workers more productive. But what's happening now is that in many cases, the machines are getting so good that they're beginning to displace workers rather than make those workers more valuable. They're actually displacing workers and making workers less valuable, or maybe displacing them entirely. Or maybe what they're doing is de-skilling jobs, so that once you would have had a job that required lots of education and skill and commanded a high wage, and now technology comes along and allows anyone, you know, even a, a very unskilled, low-paid worker to do that same job. And that, that again, is, is one of the things that um, is having an impact here. But you can see that this is a long a long story, that, and you can see that the gap between these two lines is increasing, and yet, you know, this is all in the past. This doesn't even reflect yet the true impact of artificial intelligence. That still lies in the future. You know, this is happening in, in, in um, certainly in developed economies across the world. So this is a real concern for the future, is that this whole um, drive toward increased inequality could become much more severe as, as the impact of truly advanced uh, artificial intelligence takes place. There's also going to be an enormous impact on white-collar, knowledge-based jobs, including the kinds of jobs that are held by, by university graduates. Um, and I think that people are kind of waking up to that now uh, with the introduction of chat GPT especially. You know, people are realizing that artificial intelligence can now be a very powerful tool that's able to write um, you know, very complex material. And we're already beginning to see that. There are already systems, for example, that do basic journalism, that can look at a stream of data, figure out what's interesting about that, what's the story in that data, and then generate a new story from that. And, and probably if you've read um, news articles from some of the largest online publishers, you've already read stories that were generated by algorithms and not by human journalists. Um, so, 
Uh, given you know, this potential impact, of course, one of the most common questions that, that people will always ask is, well, which jobs are going to be safe then? You know, what should I do in terms of my own career in order to prevent my job from being automated? Or, you know, what should my children study in, in school in order to stay ahead of this in their own careers? And, and what I would say is that, first of all, it's not so much about jobs, it's about the nature of the work that you're doing um, and whether that job is fundamentally predictable and routine because those are the kinds of tasks that are likely to be automated. So I think that the, the, the kinds of activities or functions or tasks that are likely to be safe this fall into these general three categories. Uh, and the first area involves what we would think of as skilled trade jobs. And this is jobs that require lots of mobility and dexterity and problem solving in unpredictable environments. So think, for example, about an electrician or a plumber. These are workers that face entirely new situations um, every day. And, uh, you know, in order to automate what an electrician or a plumber does, you would need a very, very advanced robot. Uh, the second area that I think is, is relatively safe are jobs that ge demand genuine creativity. If you're thinking outside of the box, coming up with something entirely new. Um, now, without question, machines are also becoming more creative. Um, for example, we've seen the image generation systems that um, can create images based on descriptions and so forth. But in general, I think that if you've got a truly creative job, then artificial intelligence is likely to remain a tool that amplifies you know, your capability rather than something that, that replaces you directly. Um, so those jobs will be relatively safe. And then the third area are those jobs that really require complex interactions and relationship building with other people. So think in terms of a nurse that, where, where you have a need for empathy with patients, or perhaps a business consultant where you really have to have a true, deep understanding of the needs of a client um, in order to solve the problem. So I think in terms of advice in your, your own career, um, it's not so much about you know, choosing a particular profession. There are a number of other AI risks and concerns and ethical issues, and I think that you've, you've heard about some of these um, in the other talks today, I know. Uh, but certainly one of the things that I worry the most about is this potential for misinformation, uh, fabricated false information, uh, what are called deep fakes um, as AI is used. Um, and we, we are already seeing systems that can generate um, all kinds of media that can be completely fabricated or completely, you know, represent misinformation. And what I think is maybe even more concerning is that Increasingly, we're seeing other forms of media that can, be, that can be fabricated, like, for example, audio information or even videos. Um, and, you know, increasingly, we're going to enter a world where it's very hard to see, um, you know, to, to, to determine what's real and what's, what's fabricated. And, and this is going to create all kinds of issues for us politically, um, across society, and the legal system in many ways. So this is one of the biggest concerns I have in terms of the impact of AI and how we're going to you know, navigate this in the future. Another issue is the impact on our, provi our, our privacy. Um, um, and this is really quite terrifying. But even in, in you know, Western democratic countries, there are already issues with surveillance, facial recognition. Um, and I think each society, each country, each culture is going to need to make uh, you know, trade-offs in terms of how much of our privacy do we want to give up in, you know, in return for the increased security that these kinds of technologies can provide. As I say, you know, the ultimate goal of AI is to build a machine or, or an algorithm, a system, that matches and potentially exceeds the capability of the human mind, right? So something that ultimately could be much smarter than a human being. Um, and there is a very real concern that if we achieve that goal, if we build a system that's, that's much more intelligent than we are, then we could potentially lose control of it. And that system, as a result, could act in ways that's ultimately harmful to us. And some people, some very smart people, believe that artificial intelligence taken to that level could represent even an existential threat to, to the human race. I mean, I think 
Personally, that, that's um, maybe a little bit overblown in terms of the concern, but it's a, it is a legitimate concern, and some very smart people are working on that, working on ways to build what's known as safe AI. In other words, AI that will remain aligned with what is you know, best for, for human beings, so we don't, we don't have to worry so much about losing control of it. Um, so that brings the question, then, what should we do about this? And clearly, I think that we're going to need more regulation. Um, of artificial intelligence. You know, we're going to have to begin to address these concerns. And you may have heard that some very prominent people, um, mostly as a result of, of the innovations we've seen over the last year or so, especially chat GPT, they're actually now call, calling for a moratorium on research into, um, into these areas. And, uh, you know, my feeling is that that's the wrong approach. I don't think that's going to be helpful. I think that um, we don't want to actually stop research and development in artificial intelligence. Um, so in other words, once you take the technology that's being developed and you do something specific with it in the real world, you use it in a way that's going to impact human beings, then I think there is going to definitely be a need for regulation that, that, uh, regulating that application. One approach to that that, that I think uh, might make a lot of sense is to create within our governments specific agencies that are going to be focused on this. And then the other issue I talked about, of course, is the potential for the impact of AI on the job market and the increased inequality. And I think there we're going to have to rethink our social contract. We're going to have to ultimately perhaps look at ways to decouple income from you know, traditional work. Um, and that might include looking at ideas like, for example, universal basic income or other ways to actually su supplement income. And of course, that's a very radical idea, but I think that ultimately um, we're going to be required to, to begin to conceive those ideas in order to address the disruption that's going to come from, from this technology. I really believe that artificial intelligence is not just an important technology, but probably our most important technology. Um, in terms of the current level of innovation that we have. And I think that in the future, it's truly going to become indispensable. I think that AI is probably our best hope for solving the obviously huge problems that, that we face. Things like climate change, uh, things like global poverty, uh, advances in medicine to, to cure disease. Um, really progress across the board that can make all of our lives much better um, and can make everyone, you know, in humanity much better. And what you see here is a quote from Demis Hassabis, who's the CEO of DeepMind, the company that built the AlphaGo system that I talked about. And what he's seeing here is that his goal, the goal of his company, is to first solve intelligence, or AI, and then to use that to solve everything else. And that's the fundamental idea here, that AI is going to become the most powerful tool we have to solve these problems. It's going to amplify our intelligence, our creativity, our ingenuity, and allow us to address these problems.